Good morning, it's Dave D, Powergate Technologies. This morning I have Roger Richard, who has worked on the Bork engine. How long has it been? 1979. 1979, that is awesome. And uh, so we have a control panel, uh, which is, is quite amazing. This is what Roger uses to uh, do his testing of the Bork. All nice digital equipment. The idea is to gather as much data as we can. We got a variable speed water pump three banks of chargers for the battery pack. So my partner, Bob, didn't want me to have any kind of electrical failures. He did a good job on this. This is a nice item right here. Okay. And you can hear the water pump just went out of that. So this is, uh, considering you guys are working out of a beautiful shop without federal funding, <laughs> to put it that way, uh, give me an idea for my people that are watching uh, they're interested in hydrogen, but also in free energy. Let's take a look at this engine, and then Roger, if you could, if you, all right, sh show me what we've got going here. Interested in this? Yeah. And this is the uh, aircraft engine operation manual. Okay. And this is in 1962, as I know my glasses. But this is about the time that I was down at the flight school in Embry Riddle, mm -hmm. and it was Embry Riddle Aeronautical University at that time. It's M uh, uh, Embry-Riddle Aeronautical Institute. Now it's a university. But when I was there, this was the operation manual for the radial aircraft engines that we were learning about. And it was brought up to us that if you get in certain situations in an aircraft, you can cause engine damage if your fuel detonates. And here's an uh, example of it right here where you're taking all the energy released during that stroke and you're going to release that all in milliseconds and it hits so hard that what it will actually do oh my god the top of this piston hasn't melted out that is blown out you can see the pieces punched out okay yep. and right here Pratt and Whitney says it when you get to a certain point and certain temperature all of the molecules will go at the same time the same object right here this is a rifle cartridge take the bullet out Pour, pour this into a, an ashtray, the powder, and throw a match in. And what happens? It burns. It doesn't explode. It doesn't blow the windows out of place. But if you put it in a confined area, put it into a closed bore, and then hit it with a percussion cap. Gotcha. Okay. All the molecules give up their energy at the same time. So that slow burning powder at 130 feet per second now is turned into something that can move this projectile at over 4,000 feet per second especially on the AR-15 M16. You've got a huge muzzle velocity. Why is it the same powder acts two different ways? And the reason is, is confinement. It's mm -hmm. as simple as that. What Bork did was capitalize on that. He's a very smart man. This was the original documentary, Bork engine documentary. And this was by Lois. And she doesn't say it on the outside. I never met the man, but the fellow helped her put together after Lois' death was named Elwin Kutan. Huh. And he's the one that made it possible for me to distribute about a hundred of these before I no longer could keep contact with them. This was actually given to me personally by Lois Bork herself and signed. By Lois and Hope Lawson. you guys can see. It's actually a signed original edition. Amazing. Yeah, the, yep. these are scarce as hen's teeth right here. So the information that if you get anything from me, it is original stuff, and it really, really was to my advantage to know Lois because when I was there, she gave me some information on a porting schedule. And what a porting schedule is is basically where you drill the holes in the cylinder for, for the pumping action to happen. Gotcha, yeah. And that was the latest work that Russ did, and she told me that my wife was there and another guy, she said to go in her closet and get it, and I felt kind of... Uh, you know, embarrassed about going in an old woman's closet, mm -hmm. but she couldn't. She was all crippled with the arth arthritis. Mm -hmm. And when I came out, there was a roll of drawings in there that was the last work that Wes actually did. That's incredible. So you and your partner were privy to the original well, I work. I was. I didn't know Bob at that time. The oh. curiosity mm -hmm. with my partner now, Bob Ziegler, is the fact that in um, when I was in Embry-Riddle uh, Flight School down there in 1967, uh, he and his brother actually purchased the number two work engine huh. and sent it to Embry Riddle for an analysis by their engine department down there. I happened to be there at the same time and inadvertently, unknowing to me at that time, 
Bork and I crossed paths. That's that incredible. Early, as early as that, I, that's what I call synchronicity. That's synchronicity, amazing. Synchronicity, yeah. And uh, what happened then, it made it possible for me, to, oh, I'm sorry, I was, uh, to, to actually uh, find somebody that was into these things as much as I was. Because uh, my partner kind of proved himself because he was in it, oh, just about as long as I was. Now, what Russ did was, this is a plot about his geometry. Mm-hmm. And what he does, he uses a, a roller camshaft, and instead of the roller camshaft making a lifter move, the lifters now make the roller camshaft move. That's what we call reverse roller cam, high speed. This engine will generate a sign that's relatively flat. And what this means is the piston gets the top dead center quicker. And as a result of the geometry, it will stay at top dead center for a longer period of time. In other words, dwell. Mm -hmm. This is a perfect embodiment of the two mechanical powers, the lever and the wedge. Bork combined both of these by use of the three uh, um, row slipper bearing that he put in there, and that's geometry that produces, and this has been checked by outsiders, a guy named Burger or Bigger or something like that. But anyway. Um, so in practical terms, if you have more dwell and you have mm -hmm. extremely fast combustion, mm -hmm. What does that get you? What does that net you? All right, well, let me see if I can find a little something here to write on, and I'll show you. I can probably use the back of this board because I don't think it works with more. I'll get a little sharpie here, and I'll be back in a second. Okay, I'm going to show them, yeah, show them the, the engine. Uh, actually, there, there are two of them. This one right over here. I believe it's, uh, it's like number 14, if you can... Uh, you can see this thing has a monster, uh, what did you say, this is a big Ford uh, starter? Uh, yeah, that's a, a Duramax, Duramax starter because Bob is like, uh, everything we do is Hoover Dam quality. <laughs> you know, yeah. If a big one is good, a bigger one's better. So, so this Duramax, uh, how many cubic inches we got? 30 this cubic 30 inches? 30 cubic inch, 30.5 is 500 cc, so it's not a big engine. So we got a Duramax starter yeah. on a 500 cc motor. Yeah, <laughs> hold your ears. Okay. The only reason I did that is because I'm 68 years old, and look, my right arm, after years of pulling the cord, is longer than my left arm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, this is, this is why this is better, all right? And my, my work, I think, is better. Because here you've got pressure, and here you've got time. In a conventional engine, you're going to get a burn more or less like this over time comes up, and then for the whole period of stroke. With Russ's engine, it comes up bang. You get a big power pulse right up front. Gotcha. Okay, that's a spike. Now, according to Pratt and Whitney, these, this uh, detonative force, when you get into the right mixture range, can produce velocities in excess of five to 6,000 feet per second. That's way different than gasoline burning at 130 feet per second, according to Pratt and Whitney. So detonation of, is, is explained. We know about it. And as long as it produces effects like this inside an engine, you can bet that the engineers have been schooled and trained to avoid detonation. This is where Bork came in and he stepped ahead of everybody else. What happened was Henry Ford was running into trouble with his engines. And, and um, a guy named Kettering came up and he was the guy that invented the electric starter. And Ford said, what do we do? Well, Kettering was aware that this was happening when they got up around seven, seven and a half to one compression ratio because they were running undocked fuel. Fuel that had moisture in it, and that fuel can detonate. So when it detonated, it blew up old Henry's engines. He came to a pass road and he said, uh, you can go two ways on this, okay? You can design an engine that will run under the sustained detonation and reaction which was not the regular crank, that's a steam engine, that wasn't designed for it, or you could put additives in the fuel, and what they decided on was tetraethyl lead. And the reason why they did that is in order to detonate the hydrogen that combined explosively with the oxygen, okay, you have to have a catalyst in there, and that catalyst is moisture. Now, the tetraethyl lead has an affinity for moisture. You pour that in your fuel and it grabs all the moisture, and guess what? Now it won't detonate because it doesn't have any moisture in there as a catalyst. Ah, now I recall you saying that the trade-off with the detrol 
ethyl lead, they decided to substitute something else. Well, so that, they've tried other things. Now, lead was not popular. Obviously, it's lead. So right. the mineralists have started jumping on that. Then they very quietly put in phosphorus pentoxide. That had its own set of problems. Then they came up with MTBE, methyl tertiary butyl ethers. And that's a compound that they put into the fuel to absorb all that moisture and keep it from detonating. Okay, the higher octane you fuel you got, the more resistant to detonation it is. It's kind of opposite of what you would think. The higher octane fuel will have more power, which it does because it can produce more BMEP or break mean effective pressure before the detonation occurs. So you're saying that uh, the more you pay for gasoline, the slower that gasoline burns. Right. Okay. Right. That, that's that's uh, it's designed to keep it from detonating. Now, let me ask you if you if you ran gasoline in this. They will. I, I can. Bork uh, suggested that we don't do that. He said you won't get it up into the into the detonation cycle. I found that. On this engine, uh, not so good, but on uh, this is 110 pounds can crank in it, uh, the cranking pressure on his original engine. The one that I put together is 160 pounds cranking pressure. So you've got the high compression version, and uh, you say you put together how much, uh, is, is there any part that was built by you or by your, uh, you know, your machinist? Well, or? This, this was originally, at that time, I, I knew about the original engines. I couldn't get Mr. Penny down in Long Island to sell me the number one engine. He said that when he retired, he'd sell it. So I waited 18 years up until 1999, and I got a phone call and said, I'm retiring, you want the engine, come and get it. At which point I went down and I got number one, and I do have video of that running. Mm -hmm. But obviously, if you own the right flyer, you're not going to take it out on Saturday and break the wing off. Uh, this is something that I was going to just put on the shelf. Yeah. So after that, I ma managed to find two of them, which on the V-Base, which is a fantastic thing, two of these engines on the V-Base, and both of them named uh, number 14, which is probably the rarest combination of work stuff you're going to find. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's get back to the original question. So you've got a, an engine that loves detonation, and uh, what does that do for somebody who's, say, running a Bork engine? What's he get out of it? The deal here, everybody thinks zoom, zoom. The RPM fantastic performance, which I'm convinced it will do. But work is not out for that. Work was out for economy, and work was out for safety, because he wanted to use heavier fuels in an aircraft so the guys in the bamboo bombers wouldn't crash and burn to death on the ground. Oh, interesting. Work was an aircraft mechanic in World War I, and this is when he said that the, the uh, engines of that day were closer to the drawing board than they were to reality. So Bork was in the basement level in the, in the Great War, the first war, and that's where he got his grounding and that's where he got his desire to produce an engine that would be safer and more economical in aviation mm -hmm. applications. Do you have any idea on a, a pound per horsepower basis? Well, this one is 38 pounds, it's girl aluminum, that's the engine itself, uh, without the carb and the gear reducer base, which I believe is titanium. I'm pretty sure. I'm not going to second opinion. Um, but uh, the engine is uh, 38 pounds. All right. And here's another thing I want to show you. Give me a second to find it. It's the, yeah, here it is right here. The Bork engine. This is your power curve. You notice it doesn't come up and drop off. It's linear. Oh, yeah. Wow. It's linear. 6,000 RPM, it just so goes up. So you pick your RPM and you pick your horsepower, and that's the RPM you want. That's how I set up for the 4,000 RPM, mm -hmm. which is minimum, because in order to achieve, achieve detonation, you need a particular speed. You need a speed of at least 1,500 feet per minute, mm -hmm. piston speed. Mm -hmm. And that translates into 3,750 RPM. So I stake my proto model that I built uh, to run around 4,000 RPM. And this is a picture of the V model right here that... I have. Right you have shop. a V model. That's right here in my shop. That's incredible. Yeah, that's that's is probably one of the rarest things you're going to find anywhere. Now, a V model is what 120 cubic inch. Well, let's see. Uh, that would be uh, 60 cubic inch. 60 cubic inch. 30s. That's one liter. Okay. At 10,000 RPM, that will push out 152 horsepower. That's incredible. And that's out of one liter. 
right, out of one liter. About 100 pounds, and I think that's why Bork made the pedestals out of uh, uh, titanium as opposed to uh, cast iron. Which ah. I thought they were. I think mm -hmm. box cast iron. But so uh, you, you're uh, an aviation guy. Uh, uh, how, how would you uh, rate a Bork compared to the smallest Cessna in terms of power? Uh, like a, if you if you had the the V4 that you're you're looking I at, think the, I think the V would power a Cessna. You think? Uh, yeah, 150, even 172. Wow. All right. The deal there is prop speed. All right. Bork's got a lot of power, but it's got to be geared accordingly. With Bork, you don't shift gears. You just keep revving up your RPM. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, he says good for 20,000 RPM, but. I don't want to, these things in pieces across the neighbor's yard, so I just leave them down. Yeah, you might get some, get some complaints, and it uh, would be a shame to, to lose all this hardware. Yeah, exactly. Ah, uh, you know, I, and I've just noticed, uh, I should have mentioned this. What do you think about this as a, uh, a gen set? Uh, I'm just looking at here, what's the power of this generator that we're looking at? All right, right here, this is, I call it the, uh, the pig. Give me a second here, I'm just going to turn the radio okay. on. Okay. And then save it on the very Good idea. This is a good old cheapo um, generator from uh, China. Okay. I think they run about 800. It's 24,000 watts at 1,800 RPM. There's no regulation at all, just a, a DC uh, rectifier to excite the armature. And then I run this up. On, on the gauge right here, and I can also power, I power, I got 36 500 watt trouble lights. So mm -hmm. when we start this up, we just keep plugging lights in. Mm -hmm. And then you configure whatever your loss is because this is a belt drive right here, it's not direct. And also there's uh, bearings and things like that, which are gonna tend to detract from the overall power. What, what do you call that coupling there? That is a Lovejoy coupling. Those are two couplers, three, three tooth, and they mesh together. Mm -hmm. And they're pretty good because you don't have to have them perfectly aligned. You can be off just a little bit, which I'm, I'm pretty close right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is the one I had trouble with. I, I recently converted to a tooth belt. And what here is when I get this RPMs, it, I don't know if the screws were loosening up or what. They were torqued properly, but it breaks the collet. And then it spits the key out. As a matter of fact, one of my uh, videos online, you can actually see the key flying right out of it. You'll see spark and the key going south. I'll be sure to stand back. <laughs> yeah, it's in my ceiling somewhere. Ah. I, I haven't <laughs> found it yet. Roger, what's the chance uh, one of these will fire up for us? Oh, well, both will fire up. All right. Well, let's let's take All a... Right. I'll tell you what. Um, kill it for a second. A few All things right. I want to check. And okay. Go ahead and do All right. We're going to pause, and then uh, we'll come back in a moment after a word from our sponsor. Do we have a sponsor, Roger? <laughs> do we have a sponsor? If you want to be our sponsor, give us a call. <laughs> 1-800. All right. We'll be right back.